welcome everyone um, to today's webinar, Designs for Green Infrastructure in Midwestern Communities. My name is Jack Eskin. I am a Senior Program Specialist here at the Delta Institute, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. So we will cover a number of items in today's agenda first, sort of broadly speaking, go over a lot of Delta's green infrastructure work and then get into the content and the context for the green infrastructure designs manual. Um, and then finish up with answering some questions that you all might have and um, uh, just discuss those. Um, thank you to everyone in advance for submitting questions. Um, if folks have any questions that arise in the middle of the webinar, please save them until the end um, and message them to us and we'll try to address them. So first, a little bit about Delta Institute. Uh, we are a Chicago-based not-for-profit founded in 1998. Uh, we wor work on a variety of projects and initiatives throughout the Midwest, focused mainly on environmental sustainability and economic development, um, and work with a variety of partners, including communities, nonprofits, private organizations, and public agencies. We are a multidisciplinary team of 22. We have urban planners, civil engineers, economists, scientists, architects, data analysts, lead APs. Um, and what do we do? Uh, amongst a number of things, we develop innovative programs and market-driven solutions to environmental and economic problems and convene diverse groups of stakeholders um, around solving public policy problems. And now a little bit about me. As Senior Program Specialist here at Delta, I manage projects in our green infrastructure portfolio and provide programmatic support for our urban redevelopment and brownfield revitalization projects. I am an urban planner by trade. Before coming to Delta, I spent five plus years as a planner in Northwest Indiana, uh, most recently as a Deputy Director of Redevelopment for the City of Gary, and prior to that, I served as a regional planner at the Northwestern Indiana Regional Planning Commission. In both roles, I worked on a slew of land use planning, environmental planning, and transportation projects, many of which focused directly on green infrastructure. Particularly in my time at Delta, I was, <clears throat> excuse me, in my time at the city of Gary prior to Delta, I was able to work on a number of green infrastructure projects focused mainly on planning, design guidelines, integration with gray infrastructure, and vacant land reuse. So here at Delta, green infrastructure is a key component of our overall programmatic work. We strategically approach sustainable economic development through six different initiative areas, including not only green infrastructure, land stewardship, regenerative food systems, waste reduction, sustainable buildings, and resilient communities. Um, and green infrastructure is one of these six pillars. So why is green infrastructure a priority at Delta? As many of you know, it's a strategy that not only improves the environment, but also delivers clear social and economic benefits for a community. These include stormwater management and flood reduction, uh, improving of water and air quality, beautification of corridors and neighborhoods, and reduction of the urban heat island effect. As with our other initiative areas, we have looked to scale green infrastructure through community-based planning and implementation projects, and also by developing tools and resources that assist with implementation. So, to help communities and partners deliver green infrastructure projects, we provide a variety of services in partnership with other organizations. Uh, the example from the left is a citywide green infrastructure planning exercise that we engaged in uh, with Michigan City, Indiana, in partnership with the Alliance for the Great Lakes. In Michigan City, these area-wide planning efforts have led to a number of site implementation and monitoring projects, which takes us to the main focus of today's discussion, our Green Infrastructure Designs Manual. Um, this has been a key resource for installing sites in partner communities like Michigan City um, and in advancing potential projects moving forward, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that at the end of uh, the presentation. 
Um, the guide assists communities in selecting, locating, and designing green infrastructure for stormwater management. We originally developed it in 2015 uh, and updated it in 2017 to include more designs and additional content and context. So what's in the guide? There are various decision tools that assist local stakeholders with identifying what green infrastructure technique is most suitable based on existing conditions, where to locate it, the problems that it can help solve, and the benefits that it will produce. Specifically, there are, um, uh, there are uh, guidelines, renderings, and specs for seven different green infrastructure techniques, which we'll be going into shortly. Um, and now maybe it's just important to take a step back and explore why Delta developed this resource. Over the last decade, there have been a number of local partners, whether or not for profits or municipal governments, that were consistently engaging Delta around the basic questions of how to implement green infrastructure. How do you design it? Where do you locate it? How do you maintain it? How do you finance it? And how do you integrate it with gray infrastructure? There appeared to be a need for a guidance document that addressed these questions, but was tailored to Midwestern communities, was accessible and clearly illustrated how green infrastructure was more than just landscaping. A resource that was heavily used in putting this together was the city of Portland's stormwater management manual. It's, it provided an excellent illustration of accessible user-friendly designs with maintenance cost and materials information included. Of course, the context is different in the Pacific Northwest than it is in the Midwest. The climate's different, as is the plant life, the cost of labor and materials, the existing institutional capacity, development patterns, et cetera. So it appeared to be a need to develop a Midwest-specific resource. To frame it through a broader lens, Delta has identified various categorical barriers toward broad implementation of green infrastructure in the Midwest. And at the outset of putting together the designs guide, we felt that it could assist in addressing a number of these barriers, particularly around design, awareness, planning, and maintenance. So who are these designs? Uh, intended for. Essentially, it can be used by anyone who has ownership or regulatory authority over land and property. Governments and public agencies can use this guide to implement projects on roads, parks, um, uh, public property, and can also use them to evaluate proposals from private property owners. Additionally, Private property owners can use them to implement green infrastructure on their parking lots, setbacks, and on their buildings. As part of the process, the designs guide can be used by engineering, design, and landscaping consultants and contractors that work on behalf of property owners, agencies, and land managers. And the designs can be used in various ways. Um, they first can be utilized internally for planning by land managers and practitioners uh, by helping the user select what the right design is and where the right location is and reinforcing uh, ger just general common understanding of green infrastructure design, its costs and uh, maintenance, all of which uh, is critical when you're in the planning phase. Externally, they can be utilized both in construction bidding documents as well as in site planning documents that a developer submits to municipal uh, planning and zoning departments for approval when they're getting permits. The de designs also establish guidelines and benchmarks that can serve as the basis for performance monitoring, which is a key component of any type of infrastructure improvement. Okay, so let's jump to the actual techniques. Specifically, the guidelines focus on seven different strategies for green infrastructure. Bioswales and hybrid ditches, rain gardens, stormwater planters, permeable pavement, green roofs, box tree filters, and underground storage. These techniques can be applied in different contexts by different users. Some are more applicable to roads, sidewalks, and parking lots. Some are more applicable to private property and buildings. 
some apply to both, and some of these techniques can be used in tandem with one another. Um, we will, in this presentation, be focusing more specifically on stormwater planters as our breakout example, and that will be used as sort of the model uh, for what's in each section of the guide. Um, so just giving you know, larger uh, images of these quickly, uh, bioswales, stormwater planters, and box tree filters are all techniques that are more focused on roads and rights of way. Um, so they can often uh, be sort of targeted to public agencies um, and, and DOTs. And then rain gardens uh, and green roofs are more focused on actual properties. So that can either involve actual public agency properties or uh, private property owners. And then uh, tools like permeable pavement or underground storage can be used in any of these examples. For the purposes of today's webinar, we'll hop into stormwater planners as the breakout technique um, because they are so commonly used in communities. While all of these techniques fit under the category of green infrastructure, they present uh, varying benefits and address varying problems. The guide's benefits table illustrated here was developed to specifically show what one technique can help the GI developer achieve versus another. In the case of stormwater planters, it reduces pest and urban heat island effect, improves water and air quality, and introduces green spaces into urban environments. It does not yield any benefits for noise reduction, however. <laughs> the guide also illustrates where a specific technique can be located. In the case of stormwater planters, they are located on the right of way along the street and benefit from existing space um, in a parking lane or on a sidewalk and also are best located close to existing inlets. In the green infrastructure flow chart, the decision making process for each technique is laid out. Once again, with stormwater planters uh, as the example, it starts with the question of is there space in the right of way? If so, that takes you to this question. Is there pervious area in the right of way? In a typical city street, it's often impervious, um, you know, the, the parking lanes, it, for example. So then you ask, is there a parking lane in the right of way that can be converted? Um, if there is, uh, then congratulations, your street may be qualified for a stormwater planter. Then it leads to the question of what is the infiltration rate of the native soil. If it is below half an inch an hour, then connecting the stormwater planter to the under drain is recommended. Then it leads to the question, um, or rather no matter what, a design engineer will be needed to develop an overflow strategy for large storm events, regardless of what the technique is. On a related note, we received the question um, in advance of the webinar uh, regarding how to estimate a property's soil inf infiltration rate. Typically a design engineer identifies a property's infiltration rate with a geotechnical engineer based on an in-place test that is a product of factors like soil composition and topography. Uh, the city of Seattle has a pilot infiltration test checklist that provides an example framework for how infiltration is identified. Um, but um, in, in advance of a more specific um, uh, test being done that costs a municipal government or a property owner resources like that sort of study, um, for a quick and dirty calculation, our partners over at the Center for Neighborhood Technology did develop a green value stormwater toolbox, um, which doesn't necessarily focus on a specific site, but uses generalized site conditions to calculate potential infiltration rates. So as we'll talk about before, there are various tools that um, can help with this decision making on various levels. Um, so you can go through the flowchart 
for all seven of these techniques. Um, and it also addresses the questions of, in the event, is there demolition needed on a site or environmental remediation? It will directly take you to the local and federal resources uh, that can help uh, provide solutions. So since we know that stormwater planters are our GI technique of choice, we will go into the specifics of the section. The content for all of these techniques is structured in the same way in each section of the guide. Each section defines the particular green infrastructure technique. In the case of stormwater planters, they're defined as linear infiltration basins sitting between a street and a sidewalk in the right of way, as you see right here, and surrounded by vertical curving, curving. The section lays out how it works and what it does. Um, in the case of stormwater planters, runoff flows to the gutter in the street and drains into the planter through openings in the curbing. Then it filters through the layers in the soil and is absorbed through the root system um, and ultimately clean runoff recharges the groundwater as part of the process. As with all of the GI techniques, stormwater planters are customizable by sidewalk and community. They can be as long and as wide as they need to be. A variety of different trees and plants can be used, um, all of which is listed out in the guide and we'll go into shortly. Uh, they can include changes to the geometry of the sidewalk, like curb extensions and bump outs. They can be connected to the gray infrastructure system through a perforated underdrain, and structural soil can be used to accommodate for the specific spatial needs of different root systems of plants that are being used. Um, so they're highly customizable based on the context and the community. The guide also provides maintenance information for each technique running the gamut from watering to mowing. A critical component of the guide are cross sections for each technique. With green infrastructure, all of the most important elements exist underground. This is the defining difference between a stormwater planter and say a flower bed on a street. It is worth mentioning that a key component of these installations is engineered soil, um, which you see right here. Engineered soil, which is a mixture of 40% sand, 30% topsoil, and 30% compost is specifically designed to simultaneously control stormwater infiltration at a consistent rate uh, to the aggregate below, while simultaneously filtering out pollutants and serving as the growing medium uh, for plants on the surface. Um, engineered soil isn't necessarily required to make a successful green infrastructure installation, but due to its ability to effectively manage the infiltration of stormwater, it likely increases an installation's probability of success. On a related note, um, we received a question before uh, the webinar uh, regarding how to get reliable, good information on urban soils. Um, and in discussing engineered soil, it's important to point out um, that in many instances, a site's existing soil will need to be removed to ensure that the plants um, can successfully grow in there. Um, sometimes it involves using clean fill, sometimes it involves using engineered soil. Nonetheless, to gather that soil information um, on a 30,000 foot level, the state geological surveys like the Illinois Geological Survey or the Indiana Geological and Water Survey provide really good region-wide information on soil characteristics. So that at least provides you with the general neighborhood of the soils. And then on an actual site level, a soil management evaluation uh, would be needed, um, likely conducted by an engineer um, who will be taking a number of soil probes and borings and conducting lab analysis. Um, so depending on the site, that sort of activity could cost a couple thousand dollars. Um, uh, which we'll go into in the cost information momentarily. Um, but I think it's important to point out that uh, oftentimes uh, the existing soil is not necessarily going to be the soil that's used for a successful grain infrastructure installation. So as with uh, the dimensions in the cross section and the components, each section 
uh, includes scalable cost information gathered from related projects and data from RS means. These figures are based on local averages and real quotes vary uh, from project to project oftentimes, but as with other elements in the guide, it provides a baseline, uh, which is critical. We received the question uh, beforehand, what are the best options for low cost installations and maintenance? These varying techniques have been designed to be both affordable and customizable to a broad swath of communities. Um, with that said, as far as plants go, uh, you're going to be choosing between plugs and gallons. Plugs are smaller and less expensive, whereas gallons are more expensive uh, and larger. Um, gallons are more expensive because they take more time to produce in a nursery. Um, they also give you that look of being fuller. Uh, they don't have to grow into their full size yet. And so if the GI designer wants uh, the installation to immediately look finished, uh, oftentimes they're going to go with gallons. It just means it's going to be a more expensive plant to use. Um, it's also worth noting that uh, design and maintenance are obviously very interrelated. Engineered soil can cost more than basic forms of clean fill um, or even using the existing soil on site, but it ensures a higher rate of performance, which means that you're likely going to end up with reduced maintenance costs over time. Um, simultaneously, native plantings involve more um, time spent and resources spent on maintenance in the first three years, but involve significantly less time and resources on maintenance after three years, all of which we'll be going into shortly. The guide includes specifications for each GI technique and contracting out this work, design guidance worksheets, specific details from uh, the different plantings that can be utilized for each technique, and appropriate native tree and plant species um, for each guideline uh, with a focus on soil moisture level, whether it's native to the area, um, and recommendations on plugs or gallons. There's also design and maintenance guidance for both plugs and gallons. Uh, a critical component of the native planting guidelines is uh, that they show how much uh, maintenance activities can change uh, amongst different time frames of the process. Particularly in the beginning, green infrastructure installations can require more intensive maintenance um, and care than some uh, other more conventional plants, but uh, the value add is, once again, after the first three years, these plants become comparatively low maintenance, um, and much of the work around maintenance pivots to trimming of vegetation or replacing dead plants. So three years after the completion of the first edition of the guide, we have been able to partner with a few communities in getting these techniques in the ground. We currently have a number of projects underway in uh, the community of Hobart, Indiana. This includes a bioswale and prairie installation underway in Hillman Park, which you see right here, um, partnering with Tim Kingsland, uh, who is uh, the director of the Stormwater Management District, uh, the city of Hobart. Uh, we've partnered with the Stormwater Management District and the Parks Department to plan and implement these projects. Both the bioswale and the courtyard rain garden at the middle school will be completed this fall uh, with uh, the stormwater planter and permeable pavement uh, for City Hall planned uh, for completion in early 2019. As with all of our other guides and toolkits at Delta, both the uh, Green Infrastructure Designs Guide and the CAD files around it are available for download for free on our website. And just to wrap up before we uh, focus on questions, much like our other initiative areas, our green infrastructure work is iterative. The tools we produce and the projects we advance and evolve um, go through this nonlinear uh, process of building partnerships problem solving and evaluation and in turn the designs guide is very much a product of that process and the resource as the resource gets used it will naturally be evolved uh, to best fit the needs of communities and stakeholders throughout the midwest 
So that concludes the presentation portion of our webinar. Um, I'd like to now spend some time answering questions that folks um, have submitted about the guide um, and green infrastructure in general um, uh, in advance of the webinar, and then we'll take questions that you all have right now. So let's start with uh, some that were submitted before the webinar. Uh, first question, how best do you track green infrastructure metrics? Um, there are a variety of ways in which to do that, um, and it really comes down to um, what policy question are you looking to answer. If it is um, in regards to stormwater management and stormwater quantity, gallons of decreased stormwater runoff collected uh, by a stormwater or sanitary district is a good indicator, um, as with gallons of decreased overflow from com combined sewer overflows. Also, when you're talking about the site-specific level, um, soil saturation and infiltration rates um, are, are good data metrics to collect. Then there's the question of watershed quality, um, nutrient levels, in the watershed or different water bodies are good indicators of the effectiveness of some green infrastructure um, that's been installed in the area, particularly focused on phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, and then there's the more community and economic benefits questions. Um, property values and different public health metrics while being indirectly related to green infrastructure can um, start to identify some of the impact that um, an installation or a project can have on a neighborhood. So on to the next question. How do you finance green infrastructure on private property? And to be clear, uh, that question is its own webinar or even its own um, course in college. <laughs> um, it's, it's a big question and it's uh, one where there's a lot of work and a lot of focus on innovation right now. Typically, historically, it's been driven um, through public subsidies and public programs, much like other forms of infrastructure. Stormwater districts um, and sanitary districts uh, have been starting to explore tools like stormwater fee credits, um, to help fund projects on specific sites. I know in Philadelphia and the District of Columbia, there's been a lot of work around that. Um, also in the general municipal context, um, uh, there's a variety of different tools that communities have or can use uh, to fund green infrastructure, specifically on private property. These can include um, general obligation bonds, facade rebate programs, TIF, uh, awards and just general incentives as part of developer agreements that communities can get um, into with different uh, private developers on sites. Um, for residential properties, uh, there um, have been ideas floated like a rain fund, um, and I know that uh, our partners over at CNT have explored uh, a number of different um, sources potentially for municipal governments to help fund homeowners improve um, uh, stormwater management, green infrastructure in their backyards. A lot of times it's uh, really about the source that a particular community or a particular agency can leverage. And lastly, um, there are um, improvements that can be funded, or not necessarily funded, but um, uh, advanced through public regulations. Um, private developers can be led to install GI uh, by having to comply with specific regulations within the zoning codes or stormwater ordinances in a community uh, that uh, either incentivize or require green infrastructure. And that's also sort of an innovative area um, that a lot of municipalities are exploring right now. The last thing are public-private partnerships, um, and it's very much in a, a frontier. I know a number of organizations have explored sort of toll road type models uh, for green infrastructure to help communities and stormwater districts get into compliance um, with consent decrees around their combined sewer overflows. Um, and it's led to a number of different uh, financing options being explored. A big question is whether um, these are simply just going to be 
repaid through public revenues, um, much like municipal bonds, or whether there's opportunities for other revenue sources to sort of cost share the public side. Um, you know, how to finance infrastructure improvements um, is a timeless question. And with green infrastructure as an emerging innovative technique, um, it is, uh, it, it's experiencing the same sort of finance questions that um, infrastructure improvement is in general is exploring right now. Third question, will there be any methods described on how to calculate cost above below replacement where green infrastructure is used in lieu of gray infrastructure improvements like building larger pipes? So once again, um, the tool does not specifically illustrate sort of like a cost benefit uh, to utilizing a green infrastructure method versus a conventional gray infrastructure method. I had mentioned before uh, that the Center for Neighborhood Technologies Green Value Stormwater Toolbox allows you to calculate performance of green infrastructure versus various conventional metrics um, or methods, excuse me, uh, for a number of different GI strategies, much like the ones that we use today or went through today. Um, you know, and I'd also say too that um, it's worth pointing out that none of these green infrastructure strategies do we feel are necessarily replacing green infrastructure, but meant um, to be uh, complementary of and paired together with existing gray infrastructure. So um, it's, it's not always necessarily about replacing the larger pipe, it's about figuring out what sort of improvements can enhance the performance of that larger pipe. Fourth question, what are green infrastructure opportunities for smaller communities without planning or stormwater departments to help implement? Um, that's a great question, particularly in many resource constrained communities here in the Midwest. Um, one opportunity is to partner with organizations like ours um, that assist in not only uh, project development, but um, uh, procurement of grants and grants management and project management. You know, in my last position um, where I was working for a mid-sized city with serious financial resource constraints, um, our abilities to make partnerships with outside organizations that could help deliver projects were really the difference between um, a project succeeding or not succeeding. And so um, I think oftentimes um, you know, and, and it's also important to point out too, in many communities,